Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to our last uh, day of class, as it were. Uh, the last uh, little collection of lecture video segments uh, for the semester. Uh, congratulations, you made it. Um, a couple nuts and bolts before we get started. Um, our final test is on Monday, May 11th. That is the last day, I believe, to ask for extensions to any mastering physics assignments that might still be outstanding. It's the last day on which I will accept anything submitted to Canvas. Uh, Canvas should still allow you to submit things that are late, uh, and it will mark them late. Uh, so there's that. Um, on Wednesday, May 6th, during our usual class meeting time from 2 p.m. to 4.40 p.m., I will be hosting a live synchronous review session. Uh, I hope to get everyone involved, connected to the Zoom, all at the same time to ask and answer everyone's questions about the study guide answers for which will be posted Monday night overnight into Tuesday so that you get a chance to complete the last few mastering physics assignments Monday night and then have all the solutions posted so that you can study over things on, uh, on Tuesday uh, in preparation for Wednesday's review session. Uh, coming along with uh, this last little batch of lecture videos is one final assignment, uh, one more quick worksheet. Uh, just imagine it's the thing that we would have done in class um, that um, I don't expect to, uh, to be a, a, a large burden. It should go relatively quickly. I just want to practice a couple of the things that we're about to talk about um, in these videos. I think that's all the nuts and bolts that I have. Um, the last day to submit the course evaluation for extra credit is Monday, uh, the 4th of May. That is also the last day on which you can submit a request to have the semester graded according to a traditional letter grade system, A, B, C, D, F. If you elect not to do that, uh, the default situation, uh, as you no doubt know, is to be that the, uh, that the semester will be graded on a pass that transfers, pass that doesn't transfer, or withdrawal due to um, coronavirus. Uh, so if you would like a letter grade, Monday the 4th is the last day on which you can do that. Okay, that's it for the nuts and bolts. Uh, on to the content. And the first thing I'd like to do is um, review a little bit of uh, kind of where we left off last week with the first law of thermodynamics. And I wanted to start again with a, an image that's familiar from last week. Um, here we go. This one. And that is of a thermal system doing work. No idea why I just did that. <laughs> that was very, very strange. I apologize for that. What is going on with my computer right now? Okay. Go back. There we go. Okay. 
bit of a misclick there. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, a thermal system doing work uh, that the system in there pushes on the piston by exerting pressure on it. Uh, and that pressure we explained from a molecular standpoint using the kinetic theory of ideal gases. If that pressure multiplied by that area, that's the force that the system exerts on the piston. If that piston then displaces through some uh, horizontal distance, we could find the work done force times displacement. The force is the pressure times the area times the displacement. And as we saw last week, area times displacement gets us the volume of the extra segment here, the, the volume in the space between where the piston was and where it is now. So we can express the work done by the gas pushing on that piston as the pressure times the change in volume. This trick works only at constant pressure. If the pressure is changing during this process, then um, we're, we can't do this trick. Um, it only, um, only with calculus. So, but anytime we allow a constant pressure change in volume, the system is doing work. If the, uh, if the volume expands, then the system is doing positive work. If the volume, if it's a compression, if the volume decreases, then the system is doing negative work. And that's, uh, that's the work done by a thermal system. We have talked already about two kinds, just now even, about two kinds of thermodynamic processes. Uh, the first one is isobaric, constant pressure, in other words. Um, a, a baric, like barometer, uh, uh, an instrument to measure pressure. So iso, like isosceles, same, equal. So isobaric is a constant pressure process, and that's the kind of process we just talked about uh, to ex you know, express the work as pressure times change in volume. That's this figure A right here. Figure B represents a process that occurs at constant volume, and if the volume doesn't change, if there isn't any displacement, then when we calculate the work done, whatever force there is, times a zero displacement gets us zero work done. So isovolumetric processes are noteworthy uh, because the system does zero work during such a process. Isobaric processes are noteworthy because we have a nice clean way to talk about how much work is done. Uh, the pressure times the change in the volume. There are two other kinds of process uh, that we would like to include in a, in a library of thermodynamic processes. Uh, processes, by the way, that are part of a, a thermodynamic dictionary, I suppose, uh, of words that we can use to say something, build an engine. Uh, if we're if we're making a thermal system do regular work for us, like we talked about, then these are the things that we can. These are the pieces. These are the building blocks. These four kinds of process that we're going to have available to us to affect such an engine. The other two are so. This is constant pressure, constant volume, and you might already suspect the next one is a constant temperature process. If the temperature does not change, that means that the right-hand side of the ideal gas law, pressure, volume, uh, N, R, T. Uh, tried to write large enough so that we can see that. 
if the right hand side doesn't change, then we could divide both sides by the volume and R T over V. And the story here is that as we increase the volume, the pressure goes like one over that. So we end up with a graph that looks like one over X and we get these sort of uh, down swooping, they look sort of exponential, but they're, they're not, they're just inverse relationships. One over X serves a constant over the volume. Pick a different constant, pick a different numerator here, a different temperature. Uh, we end up with a slightly different curve. Uh, try it, you know, plot one over X and two over X and see what happens see what the difference is. And, and that's the difference here at a higher temperature. Um, the, uh, the curve that it lives inside the corner of the uh, X and Y, well, the pressure and volume axes is pushed for further out of the, out of the corner, if, if you like. The fourth kind of process that, uh, that we'd like to include in our list is an adiabatic process. We've talked about constant pressure, constant volume, and constant temperature. And that's all the stuff in the ideal gas law. So the, the fourth thing is the kind of process in which no heat is transferred, neither in nor out. The system can still do work if it expands. Uh, it expands because it exerts a pressure on its uh, container. If the container increases in volume, then we're talking about the system doing work. It's just not at a constant pressure uh, because if it were, then it would be an isobaric process and that's a different animal. Uh, adiabatic curves on a pressure volume axis system like this are uh, steeper than isothermal processes. And isothermal goes like one over the volume and adiabatic goes a little bit, it decreases a little bit faster than that. As the volume expands, the pressure decreases faster. So we get this steeper curve. What actually is an adiabatic process. And uh, it, to illustrate what one is, uh, I'd like you to play along with me. Um, if you hold your hand in front of your face and breathe on your hand like you wanted to fog up um, a mirror or your glasses if you wanted to clean them, you would open your mouth wide and just sort of let air fall out of your face. <laughs> on your palm, it feels, you know, warm. But if you hold the same hand in front of your same face and purse your lips like you're about to whistle and blow on your hand that way, it feels much cooler than the first time. Now, it's the same, like, it's you exhaling, right? And it, it, unless your body temperature has decreased precipitously in the last 30 seconds, it, the air coming out of your body is at the same temperature. It's not an illusion the second time that it feels cooler. It is cooler. And the reason is that when we purse our lips, we pressurize the air that's coming out and then it gets into the space just in front of our face and is able to push on the surrounding air to expand so very quickly in the space between your face and your hand. That expansion occurs much quicker than the thermal transfer of heat energy into or out of that exhaled air to the surrounding air. It's essentially transferless. There, there isn't time for Q to MC delta T its way from the hot air to that you're exhaling to the environmental air. It still expands because it's at a higher pressure than the rest of the air in the room. And if it's expanding, 
without heat transfer occurring, it cools down. The fact that these two curves have different slopes makes me think that the slope matters. Uh, and particularly, if we, if we think about points A and B, we could get from point A to point B by following this isothermal process shown. And during an isothermal process, some amount of work is done. I don't know how much because the pressure isn't constant. It's only during the isobaric process from this other point D to point B that I know exactly how much work is done. It's the pressure times the change in volume. So we could travel from state A through this isovolumetric process to state D doing zero work. And then from D across to B doing some actual amount of work. Um, pressure times change in volume. The pressure for that isobaric process that we see in the slide is pressure marks P sub B. P sub B times delta volume, V, B minus V, A. That's the actual amount of work done. But if you notice, multiplying a pressure, which is this value, it's on the uh, vertical axis, multiplying a vertical axis by an interval on the horizontal axis. So imagine this rectangle here, we're multiplying the length times its width. That's the area. When we do this calculation, when we do pressure delta volume, we are asking for the area between the pressure volume function and the horizontal axis. Which, sorry, which means that the two ways to get from point A to point B in this figure aren't equal. If we go from A to D and then across to B, the area beneath that curve is just this rectangle, just the isobaric rectangle. But if we go from A to B, via the isothermal process. The area is this entire curved region, including overlapping with the isobaric region here. So it's a, it's a larger area and the amount of work that the system does is greater during the isothermal process because the area between that curve and the axis is greater. This is a problem because uh, you tell me state A and you tell me state B and we'd like to make an engine that goes from the one to the other. And the, the pressure and the volume at state A are related to the temperature because ideal gas law. So we know the temperature, the pressure and the volume at each state, but we still don't know how much work this engine is capable of doing because it depends how it's going to do it. If we represent it as an isothermal process, then we get a different amount of work from our system than if we use uh, an isovolumetric and an isobaric. Uh, which makes it feel like saying state A and state B isn't enough, uh, at least not to specify how much work is done. And that's, um, that's a problem. We, we'd like just to say, okay, state A to state B, here's the story. And that's where at the end of the lectures last week, 
that's where we relied on Joule to do his experiment to show us that the heat transferred in and the work done on a system are the same thing, that work and energy are intimately related. Heat and work are the same thing. Either we can keep the energy there, change the energy stored in the thing, or we can do work to transfer that energy out of the system. Written another way, the change in the internal energy is Q minus W, where in this case, W is the work done by the system. It's just conservation of energy, which we didn't know to write until Joule did his experiment to show us that work and heat are the same, same kind of process. Delta U, remember, is for an ideal gas. And, and remember, an ideal gas doesn't, it, the molecules don't interact at all. They can collide, but they collide like marbles, not like marbles attached to a spring. There's no, there's no relationship to each other. They just smack off each other and, and go on their merry way. So the internal energy of a gas is only determined by the kinetic energy of the molecules. That's the only energy we have. There are no potential energies because there are no interactions. And if it's only the kinetic energy, now remember, kinetic energy, its expression, the expression of the molecular kinetic energies is temperature. So that means that delta U only depends on temperature, which means that if we can tell, if we specify two states, A and B, because we know the temperature at each state, A and B, we know delta U. So delta U, the, the change in the internal energy of the gas is our sort of key to tracking the thermodynamic properties of a process from A to B. It doesn't matter, oops, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter how we get from A to B. We could follow the isovolumetric and then the isobaric, or we could follow the isothermal. Delta U is the same because the internal energy only depends on the temperature and the temperatures at point A and B are the same no matter how we get from A to B, right? Whatever they are, they are. Okay, we can use the first law of thermodynamics to classify, to sort of categorize the four thermodynamical processes we're talking about. Isothermal, isobaric, isovolumetric, and adiabatic. If the temperature is constant, that means the internal energy is constant. So delta U is zero. It, the internal energy can't change, so there is no delta. Which means in the if delta U is zero, then Q is W. Whatever heat was transferred in, the system did that much work on its environment. Hmm. Which is an interesting thing to say out loud because that's what we want this to do. Um, if, if we're gonna have to make an investment of heat energy transferred in, then we wanna get all of it out. Um, which makes me think an isothermal process is a good choice for an engine, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In an isobaric process, we know the story that the pressure times the change in the volume gets us the work done so we can write the first law using the pressure times the change in volume. For isovolumetric, we know that the work done is zero. 
because delta v is zero, uh, which means that q has to be equal to delta u. And for an adiabatic process, we know that q is zero uh, is by definition. We defined an adiabatic process as one for which heat transfer does not occur. If q is zero, then delta u is negative the work done by. And that's why now, now we can sort of wrap up that story about an adiabatic process and the you know, trick where we breathe on our hand. As it expands, it does work. The first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy only, that's all it is, says that if in an adiabatic process, if the system does positive work, the minus sign here says that delta u has to be negative. When we see delta u, think delta t, which means the temperature has to decrease. And that's exactly what we feel. It's not an illusion, it's, it's a real thing. It's a thermodynamic process. The air that reaches our hand is cooler because it has expanded adiabatically and therefore cooled down. Okay. How do we make an engine? We can't get energy from nowhere. We have to have some energy to start with. And then uh, the trick is to use thermal energy to do some amount of useful work. And the question is, how much work can we do as a fraction of our, the initial energy that we have? A model here of an engine, there's some high temperature thing and some heat QH is transferred from that reservoir, the high temperature area, into the working gas, the, the ideal gas that makes up the, the system. The heat is then transferred out as work. And the goal is to make the work done by the system as close to the initial amount of heat QH that was transferred in as possible. Otherwise, whatever the difference is, is going to changing the temperature. And now we have this kind of vaguely warmed up gas that we need to do something with, because if we don't have it back where it was in the same state that it started in, this isn't a repeatable engine. That's the whole trick is we want it to be cyclic. We, uh, we want to make sure that whatever state we start in, we undergo some thermal processes and then we come back so that we're ready to start again. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of a one and done scenario. Uh, and it's like, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's like a, a, um, a CO2 race car a carbon dioxide race car is you strap to the back and you open the canister and it goes and then it stops because the canister is empty and you're done. That's not an engine. That's a reaction. Uh, an engine wants the repeatability. We want to be able to come back to where we started so that we're ready to do this again. So this QL is like, it's the leftover thermal energy that we transferred in that we didn't get to transfer out as useful work. It's left in the system as delta U and we need to get rid of it by transferring heat out of the system, uh, a negative Q transfer, uh, so that our temperature and our state is back so that we can do the whole thing again. In the text QL, 
the heat transfer out of the system at the end after the work is done so that we're ready to repeat the whole cycle again is defined as a positive quantity. It's, it's heat transferred out of the system at the end of a cycle before we begin the next one. It's heat transfer out of a system. So um, I, if it's me, I would define it as a negative value. Um, but defining it as a positive value lets us write things like this. I'll try to remember to write large. QL. If it's all positive, then we don't have to worry about messing around with a minus sign here. The heat we transfer in is transferred out as work or transferred out as heat transferred to a low temperature reservoir. Okay. A steam engine is one example. The water in the uh, boiler here is heated. So that's our thermal input, QH. We get to a high temperature and that high temperature has a high pressure which pushes on that piston. Then there is a condenser which is held at a low temperature to re-condense the steam as liquid water which is then recycled through. There's another example, an internal combustion engine. Um, something very, very like this is in all of our cars. We can look a little more closely. There are different kinds of internal combustion cycles. Um, uh, if you're uh, uh, sometimes at the gas station, you have the option. There's you know the different octane ratings: um, 93, 95, 97, whatever they are, and then diesel. Uh, and the diesel fuel exists because there there's another internal combustion uh, that needs a different fuel mixture, uh, different ratios, and whatnot. Um, because it, the diesel cycle is slightly different. If we graph uh, the internal combustion cycle on a pressure volume curve, um, where is it? Oh, I don't have an example of it. There's a, <laughs> sorry about that. There's a diagram in our textbook, uh, but I can draw one here. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen for a second so that we can all see that. The traditional internal combustion engine is it's called the Otto cycle. The ideal version of it anyway, pressure versus volume, starts from starts at some high state, compressed and high pressure, and then it expands isothermally to some larger volume and the ratio of those two, two volumes. If you look up engine specifications, they might, you, they might list the compression ratio uh, and that's the ratio of the two operating volumes of the, of the piston in the cylinder. Uh, so there's some new volume and then there's a isovolumetric cooling. Another 
isothermal compression and then an isovolumetric heating. Uh, so our QH happens here when we're combusting fuel. QL happens here when we're sending exhaust out the pipe up the back of the car. In a cycle like this, we said that the work done on a pressure volume graph is the area beneath the, uh, the curve. On the way out, we get the entire area here of work done by the system. In an isovolumetric process, we don't do any work. The isothermal compression, now if it's a compression, we are pushing on the thing, the pressure of the gas wants to push out, but we're insisting that the volume decrease. We are moving that piston a displacement opposite the force exerted by the pressure of the gas. So that is a, a, a situation where the gas is doing negative work because the piston's undergoing a displacement opposite the direction. On the way back, we're getting area beneath that curve of negative work. The isovolumetric uh, heating is uh, no work done. What we net, we have this region here, which was positive work on the way out and wasn't canceled by negative work on the way back. So this region in between those two curves, that's net work done by the engine during one cycle. And our goal is to compare that to QH, our thermal investment. How good a return did we get on our investment? What is the network at that results from this cycle? So this area here, is W. How much QH did we put in and how much of it did we successfully get out as work? Okay. Let me go back to, uh, to the slides. Thinking about the kinds of process we have available to us, um, I remarked that isothermal processes give us the best return. Uh, isovolumetric processes actually aren't a great idea, so this auto cycle has some issues. Isovolumetric processes don't do any work, uh, so that seems like a, a poor choice. Um, but isothermal seems really nice because all of the Q we put in, we get out as W because delta U isn't allowed to change. So why don't we make the whole thing out of isothermal processes? Well, <laughs> if the whole thing is made out of isothermal processes, then the thermal, the temperature is iso the whole time. I mean, it's, it's a constant temperature the entire time. But if it's a constant temperature the entire time and it's the same piston, so the volume when it's compressed and when it's expanded are, you know, they're the same numbers every time. So it's the same temperature, the same volumes, range of volumes. The ideal gas law says that this is going to happen at the same range of pressures on the way out and the way back. If the temperature never changes, the pressure can't change either. And P delta V on the way out, positive work, but it's this, it'll be the same pressure pushing the other way when the compression happens, negative work. So we'll get a positive work and then an equal amount of negative work and we will net zero net work during one cycle if everything happens at the same temperature, which means there has to be a temperature difference. 
Okay, I will, I'm gonna stop the segment here and uh, we'll pick up here in a second.